Here's an idea. Popular culture is an abstract location where values are secured and challenged. ICYMI, in these final three episodes, we're talking about the principles that have guided Idea Channel. This is the second of those episodes, meaning that it is our second to last episode ever. We're doing this in the hopes of shedding some light on how and why we made Idea Channel. But more importantly, maybe it can give you something to use or even argue against in your own work or art or life. In last week's episode, we talked about capital I ideas, what they are and who gets to have them. In this episode, we're gonna talk about pop culture, specifically why I think it's important material for intellectual investment and why it's important to overthink, a word which at this point I'm sure will end up on my gravestone. Over the years of doing this show, I've encountered four common charges against overthinking that I think are vacuous at best. We're gonna talk about them right now. First is that movies are just movies. Video games are just games and etc. Meaning all you need to know about the meaning contained in some piece of media can be gleaned from its surface level content or whatever broad ideas you associate with its medium. Second, that going beyond surface level content to find deeper meaning is opinion dressed as fact, meaning the only significance we should look for is that which is objectively verifiable by, um, probably whoever's complaining, I guess. Third, that in the process of uncovering deeper significance, one is reading too far into a piece of media, meaning those who created the thing don't want or intend you to find unverifiable significance in whatever it is, and so you are bringing said significance as opposed to finding it, and that is bad for some reason. And fourth, why bother? Shouldn't we all be trying to cure cancer instead of figuring out what sorts of esoteric social and political points can be found in or made with TV shows or worse, internet may -mays? Idea Channel has been an exercise in challenging and in a lot of ways simply ignoring these arguments. We've held that nothing is just itself, that the social, economic, and cultural impact of media beyond whatever it happens to be is not only there, assuming you're willing to look, but very, very important. We've held that meaning and significance are deeply personal, hinging on each individual audience member's experience and environment, and that meaning is not at all objective. Far from being troublesome, this is what makes meaning interesting and useful. We've held that the meaning found in media is often, if not always, unexpected or unintended by creators, but that it is nonetheless still part of the work. CF everyone's favorite screed on the complexity of influence, Roland Barthes' Death of the Author. And finally, we have held that such pursuits are useful, powerful tools in deepening one's experience of the world. I partially explained how and why in last week's episode. We're gonna talk more about that this episode and the next, but first, the principles just covered explain why we do what we do. Subject media to a kind of reader response inspired theory aided interpretation slash deconstruction, but they don't explain why we choose like Welcome to Night Vale or BMO or Dark Souls, Doctor Who and Evangelion. Why focus on those things? The quick answer is those things actually contain theory that as works, they do philosophy or whatever you want to call it. Insofar as theory is the creation and defense of arguments meant to cause those who experience them to think deeply about their surroundings and experiences, there is an argument that the content of Overwatch or Jurassic Park does just that. This isn't a new or controversial position. Gilles Deleuze, who we talked about in the last episode, long held that film was important as both material for and source of philosophical thinking. Stephen Mulhall in his book On Film writes that certain films aren't just popular illustrations of views and arguments properly developed by philosophers. Such films are not philosophy's raw material nor a source for its ornamentation. They are philosophical exercises, philosophy in action, film as philosophizing. Writing for the digital science and philosophy magazine Eon, Kostika Bradatan argues that philosophers have much to learn from filmmakers, and recently, Jordan Erica Weber has written severally about video games as executable thought experiments, a topic from her recent book on philosophy and games. I like this argument, and I think it's true, but I also think it's restrictive. One common thread across the literature that takes this position is that the onus is on the work, that only certain thoughtful works do philosophy. Stephen Mulhall writes about the Alien films, for instance, Weber about Mass Effect. For me, this isn't enough. I think all media is capable of, and likely does at least some amount of potentially minuscule 
philosophical work. And I think one of the most fruitful places for finding media that does that work is within popular culture, which means we've now reached the point in this video where I should probably define popular culture as we've used it. So let's prepare. Now, just to be clear, what follows is a working definition. It is not meant to cover all the bases. For that, please see our episode on this very topic. Rather, this is a concept of popular culture that helped me decide what kinds of things are suitable for Idea Channel. For us, pop culture is media and goods which are available to the masses. So there's lots to unpack here, like what is media? I think of it as any material communication made by one person or a group of people to be consumed by another person or group of people. TV, books, and movies are media, but so are text messages, animated gifs, and YouTube comments. Goods are another way of looking at media through the lens of commercialism, but also they comprise products like makeup, battery chargers, and fidget spinners, which aren't media, but are nonetheless aspects of popular culture. And who are these masses? Well, that's anyone, really. Here, mass means a broad cross-section, a non-specific demographic, an unclear magnitude. It's purposefully vague. To give you an example by way of negation, opera is not popular culture because it has successfully defended itself, in the US at least, from the interest of most people, the masses, many of whom view it as a high-class pursuit for boring snobs. But importantly, this view of popular culture isn't about what's made for the masses, but available to them. Most people don't feel as though opera is available for any number of reasons. It's too expensive, too hard to get to or understand, there are no snacks. And so it remains, in this very specific sense, unpopular, though it may in fact have a wider viewership than many approachable things I would call popular. For many people, I think the divide between popular culture and not is the same as the divide between low and high culture, and for a long time, this was exactly the case. The first people to think and write about popular culture in the 19th century saw it as a culture of ill repute, something opposed to their own learned, respectable culture concerned with the arts and ideas. And until recently, otherwise pretty forward-thinking scholars still supported the idea that jazz music, say, was just objectively better than radio hits. To the degree the high-low distinction ever actually existed, though, it's getting harder and harder to identify. To say there's no popular culture which is smart or artful seems patently false, and to say that the two strata don't ever mix, also wrong. Traditional member of high culture, contemporary artist James Terrell, influenced one of the world's most famous rappers, and unambiguously pop cultural icon Jay-Z had a high profile collaboration with one of the world's most famous performance artists. Actors moonlight as public intellectuals, moonlighting as actors, and the revolving door between stage and screen spins ever faster to the delight of both industries. In a way, popular culture is a set of things, media and goods, but also a kind of abstract location a place where the artifacts of many cultures meet, interact, and get passed around. Popular culture is so hard to define, partly because it's a place where seemingly contradictory things mix. High and low culture, digital and analog, urban, rural, foreign, domestic, earnest, ironic, public and commercial, to a magnitude unlike anywhere else before being made available to the masses. So knowing now what we think of popular culture as being, we can talk about why it's worth overthinking. Keeping in mind the mixing of seemingly contradictory things, popular culture is the most prominent and in some cases the only place where vastly disparate outlooks gather, interact, and have shared experiences within and around Marvel movies, Beyonce records, The Bachelorette, and if we may be so bold, YouTube videos. Popular culture can make personal stories available to the masses, I think of Moonlight, for instance, and it can help vastly different people share an experience and discuss their contrasting reactions. Game of Thrones comes right to mind. This helps us develop a common language across many boundaries for understanding what it's like to be a human with a unique point of view in the world. The best case scenario is that because of this, our understanding grows. We learn from and learn how to respect one another. But Lots of times, the result is a kind of conflict over some piece of pop culture's purpose, meaning, impact, responsibility, and so on. Usually what conflict you encounter changes depending upon the specific object and the audience that's engaged with it, and we've discussed those conflicts regularly here on Idea Channel. But there's one conflict that is present in every piece of popular culture, and it's the conflict between producer and consumer. 
between those with the power to create and therefore make widely distributed statements about the world and those who are expected to consume those statements. Idea Channel favorite theorist Stuart Hall explains it this way. He writes, popular culture is one of the sites where this struggle for and against a culture of the powerful is engaged. It is also the stake to be won or lost in that struggle. It is the arena of consent and resistance. It is partly where hegemony arises and where it is secured. The producers of popular culture occupy a space of immense power and influence, social, cultural, economic, even moral, because they decide what ends up on your TV, on movie screens, in video games, what books get published, what stories we all gather around. This is how any piece of popular culture does some level of philosophical work. Any piece of popular culture is a statement about the world. By their creation alone, media and goods help their producers make an argument about what we, their audience, lack or deserve or need or should want. And that argument is philosophical. Which brings us to why bother? And aren't you overthinking things? They share an answer. Overthinking is a pejorative for intellectual activity perceived as outsized compared to its subject's imagined significance. Cognitive cycles wasted on frivolous ends. Aside from being a fallacy of relative privation, what many people call overthinking is just thinking for those accused, and I believe that it is a very worthwhile pursuit. Overthinking is one of many ways to dismantle and examine the culture that has been given to us by the powerful class of people who produce it. The most important culture to treat this way is popular culture because of its richness, pervasiveness, and influence. The act of dismantling, of examining, of overthinking is a way to use something available to us but which is not fundamentally ours. Overthinking refines our relationship to our own culture. It helps discover what about it is good, bad, helpful, hurtful, interesting, or boring on our own terms. Though Idea Channel usually took the celebratory tact, it's important that we do this whether we love the work or hate it, admire it, or are ambivalent to it, whether it seems deep or shallow, even if the results are silly as they have often been on Idea Channel. It's important to do this work anyway, to demonstrate that it can be done and that we, as audience, are willing and able to do it. Because no matter the thing, it all contains values. And as Stuart Hall says, popular culture is one place, perhaps the place, where those values can be secured or challenged. This is why we talk about neurodivergence as it relates to fidget spinners, religion and Doctor Who, feminism and BMO, capitalism and Jurassic Park. We use the tools provided by theory to excavate the values contained within or realizable through popular culture, which is defined by plurality. It's a set of media and goods which benefits from and allows discussion by broad cross-sections of people who may not otherwise ever interact. And besides being fun, we can work towards determining which facets of that culture are worth securing and which we must challenge. That is why we do this work. That is why we overthink. What do y'all think about our overthinking about overthinking? Let us know in the comments and I'll respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. For the record, I think opera is fine. I, I like a lot of it. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding ideas and who gets to have them. That will be out on Friday. We'll put a link in the doobly-doo and in the end screen. A little update about the Idea Channel farewell office hours. We filled up really quickly and then we started a wait list, which then also it seems has filled up really quickly. So uh, thank you everybody for being so excited to come and hang out with us. Uh, what I would say is if since RSVPing you have figured out that you will not be able to make it, please uh, cancel your RSVP so we can get some room uh, for some people who will be able to make it. Um, we are going to be sending out a checkup email uh, to say hey to everyone who RSVP'd um, and remind them that they did so. We imagine after that email goes out, some space will 
will be made available. So just keep an eye on our social media uh, and we'll put a link to the RSVP page in the description below. Um, and yeah. Very excited about seeing everybody there. Idea Channel has a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, and you can find my podcast, Reasonably Sound, on Twitter, Instagram, SoundCloud, and everywhere else. You listen to podcasts. I started working this week on an episode about bug sounds and how insects hear. That's, man, I think it's gonna be really good. And this week's Tweet of the Week comes from Cheese Monster, who points us towards an interesting copy desk question, which is whether or not emojis should be included in quotes printed in, say, the New York Times, or if they should be described as tiny pictures. Which, man, if there are any copy editors out there, I would love to know your take on this. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these unrepentant overthinkers.